Um, kia ora everyone and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name's Emma Forbes and um, I also have Daniel Palmer here who will also be presenting to you today. Um, so we both work in the in MPI's reg Exporter Regulatory Advice Service and it's known as ERAS for short. Um, this is our fourth webinar in our Exporting 101 series. So a welcome back to um, those in our audience who have um, seen before and welcome to those new people. So it's good to have you all here. So the webinar today will be focused on the Animal Products Electronic Certification System and this will be referred to APE Cert for short. So as a part of this webinar today, um, we will be um, talking about how um, you can raise an eligibility document and then how that links in with getting your export certificate. So um, please note that this webinar is on how to use the APU search system for raising certificates for animal products. So we won't be focusing on any, on any market specific requirements in APE cert. Um, and just as a heads up, if you're not exporting animal products such as meat, honey, dairy, uh, for example, then um, generally you wouldn't need to use the APE cert system. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. So um, the way that we run our webinars is that we'll keep everyone on mute for the duration of the webinar and ask that if you've got any questions, um, you can pop them through the Q&A box, which is either at the bottom or top of your screen on your We Zoom toolbar. Um, just to let you know that this webinar is being recorded today, so we will have a, um, a copy of the recording available on our website and YouTube for people to watch if they missed out today. So for many people in the audience today, this may be a familiar picture now as we've had it in our other webinars. So in the ERAS team, we like to think um, about exporting as like a journey. And what we're going to be talking about today is at the um, right at the end of this journey. And that's all about getting your certification for your product. So once you've met the New Zealand requirements, done your market research and met export requirements, you can then apply for your certification or when exporting animal products, the export certificate. So we just wanted to explain MPI's role in certification. Um, so you can see there um, MPI helps ensure products are fit for purpose. Um, MPI negotiates market access. Um, we provide official assurances to overseas markets and we also identify export opportunities. So export certificates are issued by MPI and they give official government to government assurance that for products that are exported from New Zealand. So export certificates are issued by us when we're satisfied that your product complies with the relevant regulations and requirements. So statements on an export certificate, um, they'll include information like the country of origin of the product and its ingredients, um, any treatment or other process the product has been has undergone um, prior to export, and the product's health status. So that's all about um, kind of clarifying if um, there's an animal or plant disease um, present in New Zealand. So moving on, um, I just thought I'd would, it would be good to give an overview of some key terms that we'll be talking to, about in this webinar. So firstly, yep, the APE search system, which this webinar is all about. So that is the online system that you use to issue export certificates for animal products. And that's for markets that require, require official assurances. Um, an eligibility document, also referred to as EDs for short. So that's a transfer document raised by an operator in the RMP supply chain. And that is approved by a verifier that confirms a consignment of an animal product is eligible for export. So once you've done your um, eligibility documents or EDs for short, um, you would then use those to apply for your export certificate, which comes last. And that again provides the importing country with confirmation from MPI that your product meets those known standards and requirements. So. If you're wondering, how do I know if I need an export certificate? 
So you would then, to find this information out, you need to look at the Overseas Market Access Requirement Documents, they're known as OMARs for short, um, as that will specify um, a lot of the time if you need to get an export certificate. Um, in some cases it's not clear, if it's not clear if you need an export certificate, the next best step is to contact your importer in your destination market or get in touch with the market access team here at MPI. So I will now be passing over to Dan who's going to talk you through some of our guidance materials. Hello, um, so recently um, last year um, our team put together some guidance materials for users of API cert um, and these are illustrated here, I'll go through them. Um, on the left hand side you'll see um, two um, quick reference guides um, for raising an export certificate or raising an eligibility document. Um, these are sort of designed to be printed out and put next to your computer on your desk while you're raising them and it's like a check checklist of everything you need to um, check when you're raising them, um, things to watch out for, um, things that you might miss, um, the format of putting things in certain boxes like um, source certificates and stuff like that and um, things to check off before you hit the submit button. Um, in the middle there's a diagram of the various stages of, of the ESA process right from the start of the farm all the way to the consumer overseas. Uh, those numbers indicate various different stages that the product will be going through um, from storage, manufacture, um, that sort of thing, all the way through to the number five certification stage where it gets the certificate and the overseas authorities um, view the certificate and it goes to your importer. Um, on the bottom is a APE cert walkthrough module which we put together and this guides you through how to raise an export certificate um, either from a single final ED or from multiple source EDs. Um, it will guide, guide you through all the various boxes, it's completely free of charge to use and it sh shows you that you start at the top on the left and it will take you right down to the bottom um, in terms of raising your certificate. On the bottom right hand side is an APE cert glossary. Um, there's a lot of terms that you kind of need to be familiar with when you're using ECERT, such as consignor, consignee, and various other ones that can be confusing when you're just starting out. And the glossary is also a good to quick reference to when you're starting out. And on the top right, we've got two YouTube videos which our team have put together. The top one is Exporting Journey of an Animal Product and it details, um, it's only a two minute one that one, and it's just a brief description of what happens in the exporting process for certification. And the second one is more of a detailed look at the process of certification um, from start to finish. And um, we're gonna have a look at that video now. After watching the video of the exporting journey, you'll understand a bit more about what animal products that require official assurance need to go through to get to the customer. Now we'll look at the certification process in more detail and your part in making sure it runs smoothly. A lot of factors and documents help ensure an animal product is safe and suitable when it reaches the customer. Take turtle milk for example. After leaving the farm, the turtle milk is processed. During its processing journey, the turtle milk can go to different premises at different locations. Every location has a separate risk management program, also known as RMP. The RMP is a written program designed to manage the hazards, wholesomeness and labelling of animal material. This ensures the turtle milk is fit for purpose, safe, suitable and has truthful labelling. Every time the turtle milk moves from one RMP premises to another for processing, it needs a new eligibility declaration, or ED. EDs are electronic transfer documents that are raised to track the process the product goes through. They need to accurately capture all the information required to guarantee that quality and safety standards and market requirements have been met at each step of the journey. 
The required information is in the Overseas Market Access Requirements, or OMARs. Once the turtle milk is fully processed, it's moved into storage and the final ED is created. The final ED compiles all the information from the previous EDs, including additional information, test results and classification for the turtle milk to be eligible in the intended market. Once the final ED is verified, the exporter can use it to raise an export certificate in the AP eCert system. The AP eCert system is an electronic certification system that tracks processing and movement of products. It's here that exporters will document that their product meets manufacturing and market requirements. When exporters raise the certificate, they need to read the relevant OMA to check if official assurance is required. The OMA tells exporters the requirements they need to meet for the destination market and specific requirements for their product, in this case, turtle milk. The OMAR also provides the exporter with the template number they'll need to use in the AP eCert system. Once the export certificate has been submitted, it's checked by an MPI certifier. They either approve the submission or return it for resubmission. Having to resubmit an export certificate due to missing or incorrect information will cost the exporter time and money. However, if the export certificate is approved, the product will successfully arrive at the destination market. This shows the destination country's competent authority that the product has met their official assurance requirements. If the turtle milk arrives without an accepted export certificate to accompany it, or the export certificate isn't approved by the competent authority in the destination country, the milk might not be allowed into the market. It could sit at the destination port until an approved eligible export certificate arrives. In this case, the exporter needs to contact MPI within 24 hours. Issues not only affect the exporter, but the industry as well. If something goes wrong with the turtle milk, this can impact the turtle milk industry and bring their quality standards into question. In turn, this can impact New Zealand's relationship with the destination country. Delays, rework and errors can cost time and money, damage industry reputations, or cost New Zealand an exporting relationship. Every step of the turtle milk journey determines if the milk can be collected by importers and made available for customers. To make sure the turtle milk reaches customers' hands at the end of the process, each step needs to be followed and all the documentation needs to be accurate, completed at the right time and approved. Because at the end of the day, exporting correctly means your product, such as turtle milk, is at its highest quality when it gets to your customers. Okay, um, so we'll start off by looking at the first page that you'll look at when you go to the ESET um, link. Um, this is an example of the gateway page for the training site. Um, you can tell it's the training site because it's it's got a pink bar at the top. So when you log into um, the site, even when you log into the main system um, and it's got a pink bar at the top, then well, you'll know you're in the training site and not the live site. Um, so this is the gateway page and the login button is the Realme button right in the middle of the screen. Um, there's also a link to the Realme page right underneath that. So if you need to get your Realme login sorted out, um, you can just click on that link and it'll take you to the Realme page. Um, so I'll just run through the shortcuts and links in the left-hand side of this screen. Um, this is a good link to the ESET application form EC01, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, that's for setting up new users. Um, there's a link to the ESET billing form. So if you've got a brand new company that's never used ESET before, you'll need to fill out the billing form. There's a link there. If you've already got people using ESET and um, you just want to add a new staff member in, you don't need another billing form. Um, underneath there is the link to the billing guide for ESET, ESET charges. Um, a brief description of how these are done is uh, you get a charge for each ESET um, transaction that you make and a per second charge for the, each time it takes for the system to process your transaction. That sounds a bit confusing, but it can loosely be translated to um, how many sort of 
options you click on the ESET application and how many certificates you submit and the time it takes the system to process those requests. So if you if you do a search for all the certificates you've done in the last five years, that'll take a long time for the system to find. Um, so that's an example of the per second charge that it would do. The same, the same would go for um, if you had a large certificate um, or an eligibility document with lots of sources, it's more likely to take the server a longer time to process than if it's a simple um, certificate with less sources attached to it. Uh, there's also the terms and conditions underneath that, so that's just the rules that people users have to abide by to use the system. There's a quick link to the overseas market access requirements as well, just as a kind of reminder that it's a good idea if you've got two screens to have the OMARs open on the other screen um, to help you raise your export certificate. Um, Underneath that, there's a suspend users form. Um, this is for um, sending a quick um, email through, a quick form through to our ESET admin team who will be able to suspend um, users who don't need um, to be using the system anymore. I'll talk about that a bit later on another option. Um, it is a bookmark link, so you can quickly bookmark ESET without having to Google it every time. And at the bottom is some XML data for people who use XML data systems and batch files, which I won't be talking about in this webinar. Okay, how do I get access? Access, as I mentioned before, is done through the ESET ECR1 application form. It's a very simple form. Um, you use this even if you've got access, but you need it to add something else on. So let's say you're a freighting company, you've just got an, another client and you need to add another license, then you'll still need to use this form, but you just click um, no in the section A and um, get that filled out. Um, so you fill out your name and details and you'll also need to have your RMP code and export a license handy to put on the on the form. You then sign the section regarding the rules. And if you're if you are a company that's raising a certificate on behalf of someone else, maybe a consultant or a logistics company, um, you'll need to get it signed off from a manager from that company. So you've got we know that you've got permission to use that particular license and um, RMP code because once you've got access, that means you have access to all of them, uh, all the certificates for that license. Um, Passwords are handled by Realme, so if you forget what your password is, uh, please contact Realme and they can reset it for you. Um, it's always best to get that reset rather than create a new one. And these forms take around one to two days for the um, ESET team to process, so it's good to allow a bit of time if you've got an urgent consignment coming up and you'll know you'll need access to this. So how do you raise an eligibility document, ED? Um, for a, a lot of people using ESERT, um, you'll be you'll have customers sending you EDs into your premises and then you'll be adding a process and then sending it out. So the easiest way to find those is to click on the most recent in at the top. And it will show all the ones that have come into your premises that have been approved. If they haven't been approved, they won't show up. And um, and you should be able to find it in the list if you know what to look for. Um, alternatively, um, you can get your custom, uh, your supplier to tell you what the number is and you can type it into the magnifying glass in the top right hand corner. Um, you'll need to use the full ESERT number, which format, which is NZL, and then the year 2021, and then your RMP code and the number of the certificate followed by a T. Um, if there is only one ED that you're wanting to use for your ED, then you can click on the cog once you've opened the ED and click on use for ED and it'll copy all the information over and all you'll need to fill out is the certificate number and the processing details from your premises. If you're raising your ED from multiple sources, then um, you'll need to click on the new certificate eligibility document option at the top. And I've done an example there highlighted um, how you type those in. So the ones I've used there are there's two eligibility documents and I'm using product five. 
from the first one and product one from the second one. If you're using all the products from both of those sources, you don't need to use the comma and the number. You can just add them in. Um, things to check when you're raising an ED. Um, one of the main ones is country eligibility. Sometimes this is something your verifier will check. Um, sometimes certain markets need to have your premises, uh, processing premises or store or manufacturing place registered with that country. Um, you can find uh, the lists of countries for those particular commodities on our country listings page if you are unsure. And once you've entered the transport details at the top, you will be entering the processing details on in the product section on the right hand side. Um, so there's a drop down list and then you add all the process types that was, are happening at your particular premise. So it could be storage, chilled storage, frozen storage, manufacturing, processing, or any of the options that appear on that list. You then put the dates that that happened. It usually starts in the date that it came in and then the date that it leaves, usually. Once you've raised the eligibility document and pushed the submit button, it will then be saved in our system and your verifier will be able to see it. Um, if it's urgent, you can contact them and they can have a look at it. They're the only ones who can get it approved. Raising an export certificate. So there's two ways you can do that. Um, usually there's a f what we call a final ED. And the final ED is um, an ED that's from usually the store and it goes from there to the exporter ID. And anyone who raises the exporter uh, certificate will be able to um, click on most recent in and it'll appear in their list and they can open that ED and then click on use for export. It will copy all the information over and all the person raising the export certificate will need to mainly concentrate on is editing, putting the transport details of the importer's address and concentrating on the attestations that will appear on the, on the template. Um, this is where the OMAR will be very useful to you on the screen next door to you raising a certificate. Um, it will guide you on what you need to fill out on the, the template. It will tell you which template you need to use and sometimes um, th there'll be optional attestations that you fill in, in the, um, that could be stuff like or mixed origin statements where you'll need to put in where what country it came from or what parts of it came from or temperature levels that, where if your product was heat treated for example or anything like that. It really depends on the um, the market that it's going to and the type of product that it is. Um, most certificates are approved in the Auckland CERT unit at the airport um, because that's where most of the most products leave New Zealand from. Um, so in the middle of the export certificate page um, after you put the importer details in and the departure date is the delivery dispatch details. So you choose how you want your certificate couriered to you, the address you want it sent to, and which if you, which signing office you want to use. Um, so you can get them done in other places other than Auckland if you choose, the, choose this option. There's also an email address that you can fill out here that will just let the person who you put in that email address that this certificate has been approved. It won't send them a copy of the certificate, but it will let them know that it's been approved. So lastly, I thought I'd go through some tip, tips and tricks for using for using ESA that people may not know about. Um, next to the new certificate um, option in the menu, in the main menu, are the following options here. The help is give access to the full help files, which pretty much details everything you could possibly need to know about ESA in great in great detail. Um, uh, it, it also gives help on raising batch files in XML if you want to learn how to use that. Um, some people use that as a way of just submitting certificates rather than logging into the site and typing everything out. 
the problem report is that if you see a computer error message um, when you're using APE set, um, so that's not to be used if you get a message back from your verifier, but that would be um, something where it's like if it crashes or something like that, you can fill out that problem report, which will is like an incident report, um, which goes straight to our IT um, ESET help desk team, who should better be able to help you with that. And the contact us is also a quick email link to that same IT help desk for ESET. This templates is uh, quite a useful feature. It'll help. It'll list all the uh, templates available in AP ESET and you can filter it by country or commodity. And it also has the attestations there, um, which you can export into a spreadsheet. The version history will give you a, uh, a breakdown of upgrades and if any changes have been made. Uh, ESET generally gets uh, bugs and um, changes made, usually as a response to like a market um, requesting different um, options available on the certificates or if there's bugs that we need fixing that people have possibly identified um, in the problem report. Um, so those changes and fixes will appear in that in that list. And the user report, um, as I mentioned in the, the first slide, this is something that you should probably run a few times, um, maybe every month. Um, and I'll give you a list of everyone who works um, who has access to APE cert for your premises or for your exporter license. So if you know that um, someone used to work for you and you, you're not sure if they've still got access, it's good to run this report and it'll give you a list of all of them. And that's it for me. Thanks for that, Dan. Um, so we just want to take the opportunity um, to now um, summarise some of our key messages for today. Um, so firstly, um, as we mentioned earlier, we have an array of APE cert guidance material available on our website to use, including that video if you wanted to watch it again. Um, but if you're still, um, if you still have a few questions on how to use the system after looking at the resources, we can um, um, help with that. So um, just email through your questions and we can help. Um, secondly, so a lot of using AP, APE certs and exporting animal products is um, questions around out product eligibility. Um, and those sort of questions are best to go to your verifier as they can help you out with this and clarify that. Um, thirdly, um, it's really important to refer closely to those um, overseas market access requirements or OMAR documents when you're um, using APE cert as this will tell you um, what certificate template number you need to use for your product going to a specific um, market or country. Um, and lastly, um, so our team are currently working on developing a new pro um, training program. So that's going to involve providing one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one advice to exporters and businesses and providing um, in-person training workshops. So um, stay tuned for that. Cool, so um, just as a FYI, so we've hosted, um, three, this will be today's one's our fourth webinar, but we have completed um, three webinars before this and they will be um, um, posted on our exporting webinar webpage that we've just created. So at the moment we've got exporting 101, um, you can see here as it been uploaded, but um, these will be getting added in as time goes on. So. If you have any um, colleagues or um, other people in your team that missed out today or would benefit from this, um, we'll be sending out um, a link to where this web page for you guys to um, refer to if you wish. So, cool. So, um, thanks everyone for joining us today. So, um, just remember um, that. ERAS team, we're here to help. Our contact details are on the screen there. Um, after that, after today's webinar, we'll send out a follow-up email and that'll just contain the presentation slides 
and um, our resource pack, um, which has a whole bunch of information on exporting and some of the resources we've created. And that will also include um, links to those APE search specific um, help um, tools as well, like the video. So keep an eye out for that. Um, we have another webinar planned for the end of this month. Um, and that's going to be based on, um, focus on rather um, risk-based measures. And that's uh, basically the registrations that um, food premises and other premises in New Zealand need to get when they're exporting. So um, if you're interested, um, we'll be sending out a link to all the attendees today and you can sign up um, once we've got that all organized. Um, Cool. Um, well, thank you, everyone. We'll wrap it up now. But um, yeah, just get in touch with us if you need help with exporting. Cool. Thank you.